Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Health vs. Wealth. Today's episode is on longevity tech, and I have with me, Jeremy Ao. This is actually a continued conversation from our previous episode, where we talk about plant-based protein and alternative food. If you'd like to know the latest trends in that scene, feel free to check out the previous episode. Coming back to today's topic, to start things off, I asked Jeremy, an investor who I've bumped into in multiple longevity events now, about how he views the longevity tech scene and what interests him. This is what he has to say. Longevity is interesting because it taps into some very deep human impulses. From my perspective, there are two strong forces for humans in terms of motivations. One is get rich. The second is don't die. When we're all young, we all want to get wealthier. We want to accumulate more resources, get more power, get more influence. I think it's a natural part of striving because, you know, people who are young and teenagers and 20s and 30s want to become significant and do something important in their lives. What's interesting is that for many people who have already achieved that threshold, once they hit a certain level of, you know, financial security and prosperity, and as they hit their 40s and 50s and 60s and they see their parents pass away, they see some of their friends pass away, um, they feel themselves getting injured or they themselves, you know, suffer some from chronic or impending critical disease, then I think the self-awareness of mortality kicks in. And that's where people really focus on preventative health and wellness to get better and stronger. It's a tale as old as time, you know, we have the famous uh, explorers looking for the eternal fountain of eternal youth. Ha! Eternal fountain of eternal youth. But the truth is, um, this idea of a longevity, you know, escape pod has been around for a long time, right? Uh, and, you know, you know, for those who know Chinese history, I mean, Qing Shi Huang is, you know, the first emperor of China who kind of unified and so, so forth. Uh, he created the Qing dynasty and he united the whole uh, country and he won. In other words, he got rich in that sense. And then once he got that, then he started trying to live forever, right? And so he called his alchemists and doctors to help ask him how to live forever. And, you know, he drank a lot of mercury because he thought that was going to help him uh, you know, live longer. It turns out he didn't. And so he passed away early and then, you know, his son was underprepared and, you know, they lost the whole dynasty as a result of it, right? So, you know, if this guy, you know, thousands of years ago really wanted to live forever, well, guess what? You know, like if you go through history, every king, every person always wanted to live long for, for longer. And even today, if you look at so many billionaires, um, you look at the way they're framing it up, they've, a lot of them have uh, invested in longevity companies because, you know, they're interested in it. What else are going to do with the money? Make more money when you hit that threshold where there's drastically diminishing marginal utility where every dollar they earn. So I think there's an interesting dynamic where, you know, I think in a youth, people trade health for wealth. And then when they're older, they're like, okay, we're trading wealth back to health, right? And so there's an interesting conversion process that's happening. And so I think longevity taps into that promise, you know, of a longer life, um, you know. And that's very different, right? Because you told me, Sanitation. Sanitation also improves the life uh, span of the general population, right? And so, so many great doctors uh, and epidemiologists and nurses and public planners and civil servants built sewage, you know, to increase the sanitation health and therefore reduce the burden of, you know, fecal borne diseases, right? Um, and improves the living conditions for our cities, you know, it's a tremendous longevity, you know, innovation. But we don't look at it that way because we look at it as a sanitation and infrastructure, you know, perspective. I think what's interesting about longevity is moving away from infrastructural, uh, healthcare and sanitation, so, so forth, into more of a personal aspect, right? We're just, you know, it's not about the country of America. It's not about the city of Singapore. It's not about the neighborhood. You know, in you know whichever city that you're in, but you know it kind of balls out to, you know, this is what we can do for you individually, and this is what importantly, this is what the science says, and not some random alchemist saying it, right? And so I think the idea of statistical validity and proof in a scientifically rigorous way, I think is the second half of it. So I think it's interesting because you're combining something that's very old which is that people don't want to die. Doesn't mean they want to live longer. Doesn't mean they want to live healthier, especially when there's a trade-off against things they like, like eating tasu, 
or smoking cigarettes, you know, driving without seatbelt, right? These are all fun things to do. So it doesn't mean they're going to want to live longer, but people don't want to die, you know? So I think there's an interesting psychological reality there that we have to be aware about. So that's one aside, but there's a very old motivation as old as time itself. But combine something very new, which is the promise that this time around is for real. And I mean, if you think about it, you know, like if you open up every magazine for the past 200 years, they've always promised some random longevity molecule or product, right? You know, you had 200 years ago, you had people traveling around towns in their little wagons and they were promising Alexis from their apothecaries saying like, this is going to help you live longer life, right? You know, uh, you know Coca-Cola used to be an elf drink, right? You know, not a soft drink, right? You know what I mean? And it just happened to taste delicious at the same time. So you're like, oh, guys, improve my health and taste delicious because here's a bit of cocaine. In it. And then, you know, you fast forward now to the day. Like, what I'm trying to say here is like, it's a tale as old as time. But now I think we're starting to see the scientific uh, validity of it. Um, and so I think that's where the longevity space is coming together. Most of the science and most of the work in longevity tech is done in the West. So in the next question, I asked Jeremy how he sees this trend play out in the years ahead. When we look at longevity, obviously there's a pyramid, you know, there's off interventions, right? You know, the awkward reality is that, you know, exercise is probably the best, you know, intervention that people could do, increasing a VO2 max. You know, it's like, you know, you you know, you look at the scale of interventions of all all the way from exercise to diet to sleep, which is adding a big three to do, which doesn't require any, you know, pharmacological intervention, really, although I think a lot of people struggle with it. And all the way to the other end of the scale, which is, I think, a scientific discovery about what goes into aging. That's one side. And the other side, what are the interventions on a drug slash, you know, operational perspective to increase longevity. And I think what we have to be aware about is that there are geographic clusters to innovation. So, you know, when I mentioned, you know, cars and the manufacturing of cars, very few people would be like, Boo, Jeremy, you mentioned Germany, Japan, and Detroit, right? I mean, like, everyone's going to be like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, that's where all the manufacturing is. We don't see any car manufacturing really in Singapore uh, and or Indonesia or Thailand or Philippines as some in Malaysia. So there is obviously, you know, a, an understanding that there is clusters of innovation and it's very obvious in manufacturing, for example. Solar cells is pretty obvious, you know, it's primarily being done. I know right now. So when we look at longevity, we're fundamentally looking at the state of human research into aging and intervention into it. And the reality is that most of that uh, research globally is being done out of the US, um, specifically, especially in Boston uh, as a cluster, and to a lesser extent, San Francisco and New York um, and Atlanta. And so if you look at that dynamic, you know, we can ask ourselves, like, why is this happening, right? Well, first of all, you know, America is a rich country, um, and it was one of the first few to really create that systematic structure, not only of doctors, but also of clinician researchers, right? So that uh, duality and combination of doctors who are also doing the research at the same time. And that's not the same medical system that's around the world. I think that many Medical systems around the world is very focused on clinicians because they focus on provision of healthcare as a priority of especially emerging markets, but not necessarily on the research side because that's, you know, as you can imagine, you know, detracts from the clinician work when, especially when your population uh, has urgent healthcare needs, like we talked about it cholera, sanitation, uh, basic health requirements. You know, the second piece is that, you know, the US has a very strong concentration of universities. There are hubs for research and development and have large government grants and subsidies uh, and programs that support these pathways. So, for example, we look at the genome of human people, and that was first, you know, kind of like the sequence, right, in full, especially thanks to the help of the US government to sequence not just the genome, but also later on to sequence cancer cells. And so, a lot of that funding is actually flowing into basic science via the US government system. The third aspect is that there is a strong, you know, uh, patent system in the U.S. uh, and they have the ability to not only patent, you know, various inventions, but also patent drugs. 
And these drugs uh, are obviously, you can see Pfizer. We saw that with Moderna. We saw that in the COVID vaccine time. But the, the ability for the US to not only be able to bring the basic R&D into something that's a viable uh, target, that to eventually make it into uh, rigorous testing for, to actual deployment. And as you can imagine along the way, you need to have FDA approval uh, where globally regulators are looking at them for guidance and to set precedents uh, on the regulatory approval side. Also, America has the scale-up facilities, right? On the, not just uh, in-house for manufacturing facilities for the big ma drug manufacturers, but also a lot of contract manufacturing plants uh, for newer drug candidates. And so that expertise is not just imagine, you know, clinical researchers, but you can imagine, you know, all kinds of engineers and, you know, statisticians and modelers and, you know, folks just figuring stuff out together. And that's hard to, therefore, to, you know, reinvent that value, let alone port it uh, to Asia, right? Uh, because you need critical mass of talent and population and government support to make it happen. And so what that means in the US is, you know, you have a lot of basic R&D, you have lots of clinician researchers who are doing all the research and doing advocacy and seeing patients. And and you see a lot of startups um, who are, have their yeah, future economic pipeline protected, right? Um, and the US patent system is able to not only protect them within the US, but also protect them globally, right? Um, and that's very different, for example, because if you look at India, India doesn't have the strong drug patent because they made a decision that they want to allow generics. And generics are important because they're able to take globally the drugs and distribute them at a much cheaper price because you're no longer giving them the legally allowed monopoly that the US or the West or the rest of the world would do to compensate the drug manufacturer for taking on 10, 20, 30 years of basic R&D at risk right? And, you know, you're not going to give that ability to pay that back because now you're charging it effectively at cost price or plus a small percentage. The consequence, of course, is that India benefits from cheap drugs and so healthcare is able to be cheaper uh, for its population. The trade-off is that, you know, the R&D into novel patented double drug molecules and candidates like biologics is not being done in India, it's being done in the US again because they know that's going to be protected, right? And so they want to in-house that talent and they don't want that to be copied, right? And not giving them the ability to earn, you know, super normal profit for X period of time to compensate them for the super normal risk they've taken on. So those things means that the US, and to some extent, I wouldn't say the US, but the West in that sense, because the US is working in the University of Cambridge, the UK, you know, is doing, you know, um, you know, clinical trials in Puerto Rico, like, you know, the, the concept of that, um, you know, you know, do research, write in English, peer reviewed in scientific journals, people replicate each other's experiments, that global apparatus, the center of gravity from a pharmacological and health perspective is in the US, right? I mean, so if you look at it, not just in terms of longevity, but you look at it in terms of like, Alzheimer's research, you know, cancer research, all these like acute diseases, a lot of that is a lot of that fundamental research is being done out of the US. Now, when we look at Asia, I think what's interesting is that I think the demand is there, right? So, you know, I, I, Asian people don't want to die just as much as America does, right? You know, we're all human, we all don't want to die. You told me tomorrow, you know. Um, there's going to be a car crash, I'll be like, okay, I'm definitely wearing my you know, seatbelt and you know, maybe I'll wear three seatbelts uh, today to make sure that you know, <laughs> you know, I don't you know, get hit by a car tomorrow. So that's going to happen. Um, but like you said, the supply of those innovations uh, for now and in, and in the foreseeable future is going to be, I wouldn't necessarily say American, but very much, I think, very strong links to places with fundamental research, which happens to be in the West right now. Um, I think where that changes and I think what we see is that uh, there are two parts. One is uh, I think we're starting to see one um, research and manufacturing being done in both India and China. So India, of course, they have generics, but as, along the way, they've of course built a very strong um, drug manufacturing set of team, right? And so people are doing innovations and R&D in their own way, even though they don't have the same 
profit incentive they, as they would in America. Um, and I think in China, obviously, they're also doing their own set of research, especially on their own population health as well. So I think everybody's really focused on population health. And so that all that's happening. But I think, like I said, the R&D is not easy, but it's only the first step of a very long set of ways to eventually get something all the way from you know, R&D all the way to commercialization to actually scale. That being said, you know, people exercising more, sleeping better, and eating healthier should be a global phenomenon. There's no uh, patented uh, your proprietary way to do those, those things. Uh, and so, you know, no matter where you are in the world, I hope that you do those three things, for example, because it's going to be honestly not just 80 20, but, you know, it's probably like 95%, 5% of, you know, the entire longevity uh, outcomes in terms of potential improvement. Having covered about the overall landscape, I asked Jeremy, what are some companies or personalities that are perhaps worth highlighting? I had an opportunity to meet uh, Brian Johnson. Uh, he swung by Singapore to share about Blueprint. And, you know, that was interesting because, you know, you, you had consumed some content about how he is um, not just, you know, advocating for better health, but he himself is the guinea pig for a lot of these experiments. So in terms of like calorie restriction to uh, injections to, you know, light therapy slash treatment to, you know, gene editing. And so he has a very strong public image on one side. And on the other side, Frankly, yeah, that was an interesting experience where I got to meet him in person and see what he was like in person that's separate from his, you know, what he's showing on, on the media, right? Um, what was interesting was that I think there was a very strong, I think, realization from my perspective that he understood how people buy. Um, and what I mean by that is you know, I think people can just talk theoretically about longevity all the time. But, you know, I think he's kind of saying like, you know, I practice what I preach, right? Uh, I'm doing this, I'm documenting this. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a very human thing, right? Which is that humans buy from other humans, right? And I think I always say like, wow, when you say that, Jeremy, like, duh, like, you know, humans buy from other humans. But, you know, especially I think for wellness, especially for health, like this is that was like, you know, if you look at somebody and the person's like super unhealthy and you're like, you know, I mean, it happens a lot, right? Actually for, you know, in the medical system, there are many doctors who are very, very unhealthy because they're very stressed, not sleeping well, um, you know, and because of that, they're eating a lot to cope with the stress and so they're very unhealthy. And then, you know, guess what? People don't really feel comfortable taking medical advice from them because they don't look healthy, right? Um, again, you know, it's because you know, the medical system is very pressurizing. So, you know, it's a structural environment dynamic. But, you know, I think patients are, you know, you know, they have eyes and they're humans. Um, and they have their sense. And so I think what's interesting is that I think the reason why Brian Johnson is able to, I think, create that sense of trust is because, you know, he's willing to do it, right? And and the truth is, the moment you kind of like stick out, then, you know, people love you and people hate you, right? You know, there's the tall poppy cutting syndrome, right? Where it's just, hey, you know, and I always tell people, it's like, yeah, you know, he's doing it for himself, like, you know, so be it, right? Um, I think we also see, I think, other folks like Peter Atia with Outlive. We see, uh, you know, Huberman with Huberman Labs podcast. So I think there's a lot of folks who are talking about longevity and speaking and being role models in their own way, right? Um, so I was watching like a YouTube short recently and, you know, Peter here was like, you know, on his, you know, cycling bike and he was recording on his phone. He's like, this is what zone two exercise looks like. You know, I'm, I can speak, but I'm kind of like, you know, gasping a little bit. And then I was thinking to myself like, hey, you know, what, you know, I mean, at some level, what's different from him and every other fitness YouTube channel that I've seen, right? You know, there's a lot of fitness folks you know, ranging from people wearing yoga pants to people who are super bulked out, you know, to everything in between. And YouTube is full of fitness channels for that reason. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, you have doctors now who add that credibility, right? You know, whether they are a PhD or a clinician to be a professor, you know. But, you know, I think that's that uh, in print, I think, of a university and the scientific research and a peer review that's implicitly behind that on one side. Uh, so as a result, I think they have 
legal consequences in some ways to say what they're saying as long as they're scientifically credible. So I think that creates some level of flaw of trust on one side. And on the other side, I think these doctor influencers are practicing what they're preaching, right? In that sense. So they're demonstrating it, they're explaining it, um, they're framing it up nicely. And I think that's an interesting um, dynamic where um, all the startups that you see are all very human influencers, right? So you see Brian Johnson, um, you see Brad Stanfield, right? Um, you know, you see, again, Huberman, you see Peter Asia, uh, you even see Sinclair as well, to some extent. And Sinclair is, interestingly, you know, the pioneer of this field, but it's probably the most low-key out of all of them. So there's an interesting uh, dynamic there, even though he did uh, write a quick as well. So I think that's interesting for uh, reflection. To round off the conversations, since we're at the start of the year, I asked Jeremy if there's any longevity routine that he's experimenting with or adopting this year. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is that, you know, when we kind of like flashback uh, to, you know, four years ago, right? You know, I was like medically obese uh, because again, I was drinking a lot of Soylent. I was very stressed. I was a founder. I wasn't sleeping. Uh, and then, you know, I had no friends. And so, you know, it, you know, and, you know, on my podcast, I actually um, recently released a podcast episode talking about some of the mistakes I made. But one interesting realization I had was that, you know, at the end of this, you know, the founder journey where I sold the company, I did the blood test. And it turns out that I had like, you know, very low vitamin D, right? I was deficient in it. You know, I had pre-hypertension, I was pre-diabetic, I was obviously, I said, obese. Uh, not overweight, but obese. Um, and, you know, there's all these like issues that I had on one end, right? And then what was interesting was that over the past few years, I've slowly kind of like transitioned, I've become healthier over time. And I think last year I was quite proud of myself because my last year's year resolution was exercise twice a week. And the way I did it was by engaging a personal trainer to come in in the morning and come to my place and then we just work out, you know, and I crack it uh, in the morning and just do it. And I was like, great. And, you know, I also went back for my army reservist training and, you know, I did well. Like, you know, I was like, I hadn't done my, you know, push up test, sit up test or 2.4 kilometer. I hadn't run the 2.4 kilometers for effectively, oof, um, wow, time flies, uh, for effectively 15 years, right? So I remember I was like running around the track, you can imagine, right? Running by 2.4 kilometers. Um, and I was just like, wow, okay, I know and remember how I used to run this, which is like, you know, eight minutes, you know, and I know how I'm running this now, which is closer to 12 minutes, which is still good actually. Uh, but it was just like, whoa, like you can feel that difference, especially because you haven't run it for a long time. Um, and so I'm proud of myself that I was able to kind of like uh, turn my life around in terms of weight, but also finally last year institute like a regular you know, weightlifting routine on top of my previous, you know, um, you know kind of like walking routines. Um, I think for this coming year, I, I think that two things I'm really doing, I think first of all, uh, one, my new resolution is to do um, an hour every day for something that's longevity related. So this which is quite interesting. Uh, you know, historically, you know, I used exercise to lose weight. And once I got to a weight that looked socially acceptable, I was like, good enough, right? Because, you know, when you're like young and dating, you want to, you know, skinny enough and muscular enough is for dating purposes. Then once you become a, you know, a dad and you're in your 30s, socially acceptable is just like, good, you know, you're like not of you know, weight. You're just chill and you can be skinny fat effectively and, you know, it's good enough in Singapore, right? Um, so I think it's been interesting now to be like, yeah, I want to structure that one hour every day just be like either doing like zone two cardio or, you know, high intensity training um, or kind of like doing a workout um, and then, you know, having one rest day in a week. So, so far uh, in the month of January, I've been on track with that, which is uh, you know, kind of like doing something um, and part of that as well is doing a sauna. So supposedly the sauna is good for you uh, because of all the Nordic countries. Uh, so I've been uh, trying to do the sauna slash cold shower thing once a week. I don't know. I feel like this is like, you know, sometimes like, you always kind of like scratch your head a little bit because you're like, I hope this works because, you know, if in five years time the scientific review from literature changes his mind, I'll be like, wait, I spent five years, <laughs> you know? once a week going to the sauna and then 
you know, suffering and abusing myself in the cold. Um, so let's see how that shapes up. But, you know, um, definitely an invigorating way to start the morning. So I think there's been an interesting change. So I think that's one set. Um, I think the second aspect about it is, in terms of longevity as well, is uh, being more in tune with the fact that I'm an older person. So over the past year, when I was scaling out my fitness levels, I actually injured myself twice, uh, especially before the army fitness test. So one was uh, I managed to, I guess, pull my neck when I was doing sit-ups. Um, and then uh, secondly, I managed to get some level of heel pain uh, after scaling out for my running, right? And I think part of it was just like fundamentally like I'm older now, my muscles are more stiff, I'm less fit, I was starting from a lower base. And so working my way up, you know, just long story short was now I need to be much more thoughtful. I need to like stretch a lot more. I need to do dynamic and static stretches. Jury's still out, which one is worthish. Um, and then, yeah, I just need to kind of like be more gradual in how I ramp up um, and be a lot more thoughtful. So, you know, recently I was just like, you know, thinking about you know, hiking a hill and normally I would carry a backpack. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do my extra work. I'm going to like stash my bag away in the car and just walk up without anything because I know that if I do it, I'm at risk of like increasing um, my risk, right, uh, for my heel pain. So I think there's an interesting self-awareness on my aging dynamic, um, which honestly isn't fun because, you know, though, yeah, because, you know, you're like, ah, I can do this and I can cycle the next to Singapore and, you know, uh, you know, so it's like, like intellectually, you know, you can do it. And then the other part of me is like, ah, I got to be a lot more pragmatic and practical about this. Otherwise, you know, the truth is, yeah, you know, like, um, the moment I got my heel pain, I was out of action for two months. You know, it took me two months to heal. And then I had to figure out how to improve my cardio and do my core workouts without engaging those muscles, which you can imagine is quite difficult, right? So instead of doing sit-ups, you're doing crunches and planks because you're trying to avoid using your neck muscles. And then to do cardio, you have to start cycling and using elliptical to avoid aggravating your heel. And then you only really do a run like once as a warm up, and then you do your two point four kilometer run as the actual run. So you build out your VO two max using everything else that's low impact, but you keep your only impact activity. And the only thing I try to say is like I spent a lot of time my personal trainer strategizing around my injuries to not injure myself again. And now I'm just like you know what I just need to stop injuring myself so that I don't have to go into all the work of strategizing around my injuries. Now, as Jeremy has alluded to, it's indeed harder and harder for you to take care of your own health as you get older. So, pardon me as an entrepreneur doing a little sales pitch here. I've just launched my own sports and healthy aging lab. We help you find out your key metrics related to sports and aging. So, things like your strength asymmetry, how you fare against strength baselines, your VO2 max and training zones, etc. And that's not the best part because the purpose of us bringing in all this world-class equipment and helping you know all these metrics is to enable a whole new type of training that is time efficient and safe even for seniors, cutting down your training time by, in some cases, 90%. If you are interested to find out more, please feel free to check it out. Links in the description of this video. That's all for now. Till next time, take care.